So look at somebody beside you and tell them, I'm glad you made it to church today. Come on, tell that same person, tell them, I'm making room for Jesus. Come on, we're making room for Jesus here today. Well, grab your Bible or your device. Now, today, I did not make a handout to give you when you came in through the doors, but my notes are available on the YouVersion Bible app or on the church app. Actually, the church app will take you to the YouVersion Bible app if you would like to follow along with us here today. But I do have for the few minutes that we have remaining together today, just something burning my heart that I believe the Lord wants me to bring to you here today. But before I do that, I just uh, wanted to bring you something even a little funny. Now, I'm not as good as Tim Hawkins, by no way. That's just amazing there. But um, I was reading something one day, and it's, that it's basically says this. You know, of course, you know, it's one of those things that... Um, you know, people celebrate Santa Claus and reindeers. There's all of that. That's just part of our culture and our society. But uh, just reading this, that it, it is now a scientifically proven fact that Santa's reindeer had to be all female. So ladies, you may enjoy this, but according to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, both male and female reindeer grow antlers in the summer each year. But male reindeer drop their antlers at the beginning of the wintertime, usually late November to December. Female reindeer, however, retain their antlers till after they give birth in the spring. So therefore, according to every historical rendition of, uh, of depicting Santa's reindeer, every single one of them, from Rudolph to Blitzen, every one of them had to be a girl. And we should have known, right? Yeah. Only a group of women would have been able to drag an overweight fat man around in a red velvet suit <laughs> all around the world in one night and not get lost. Is that right, ladies? <laughs> Sorry, guys, I had to bring that one. <laughs> guys, you send me good jokes, I'll use your jokes too. All right. All right, let's get our focus now upon Jesus and the word of God here today. So if you would, would you bow with me here this morning? Father, we do thank you just so much for all that you've already done here in this service today, Lord God. Lord, I just am amazed to be part of such a great community of believers, Lord God, and Lord, I just believe there's something, though, that you want me just to unpack to each and every one that's hearing my voice today, Lord God. So, Lord, I ask this, that you would give me the utterance, Lord God. Father, I surrender Brad Mendenhall. I surrender, Father, to you, to Holy Spirit, to speak through me, Lord God. Lord, I pray for all of us, as I always do, Lord God. Father, give us the eyes to see in the scriptures what you want us to see, and give us the ears to hear, Lord God, what you would have us to hear today so that we may apply the scriptures, these principles in our lives, that we may take another step in our journey with you, Lord God. Father, that our light will be brighter, shining in this dark world that we're living. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Everybody with me here today, say it. Amen and amen. Open up your Bible here with me or click on your device to the, to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2. Last two weeks, we had been in Luke chapter one, but I want to go to Luke chapter two. Our theme of our service here today is simply this, to make room, to make room. Man, incredible songs we've had, just everything has been so beautiful. But I believe as we dive into scriptures here today, there's something the Lord also wants us to see. So as we set this up for us today, let's go to the story in Luke chapter two, where we read more of the Christmas story. I'm gonna be reading out of the New King James Bible here. Luke chapter two starts out in verse one. Look at it with me. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Verse three. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Verse four, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. Verse five, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Verse six, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Verse seven, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger. Come on, say this last part with me. Because there was no room for them in the end. I'll stop right there. We'll pick up the rest of that story. We got, you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning to finish that story. But uh, the story of Mary and Joseph having to travel to Bethlehem and 
If you're like me, this is a story that you've heard pretty much all your life. And I say this so many times, you know, when you are continually exposed to something, you become very familiar with it. And familiarity, many times when you become familiar with something, you lose the power of it. And just with the whole theme that we've been talking about, just making room, without a, I believe this is something from the Lord here today. We see here in the story where whenever Joseph and Mary get to Bethlehem, there's what? There's really no room. And of course, remember the story. You know, we live in a plush American environment, the culture we live in. We got our cars, we got our houses. I mean, when we travel today, we jump online, we make our reservations, you know, we get hotel rooms, we get our Airbnbs. I mean, you know, you got to admit, we got it pretty plush. Pretty good. But during this time frame, come on, how many of you ladies remember the days of carrying a child? Anybody remember your pregnancy days? You know, maybe for some, it's been a long time ago. <laughs> maybe for some, it's relatively, you know, recent. But again, can you imagine Mary being nine months pregnant, being there at the end of her term, and Joseph comes home, hey, Mary, guess what? We got to go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem? Well, Bethlehem is what? It is because scholars tell us probably around 90 miles away. So 90 miles traveling, ready to give birth. I mean, she's at the end of her pregnancy. Could you imagine ladies, a journey that probably took them probably five days to go 90 miles, could have been on a donkey, could have been in a cart pulled by a donkey, but come on, how many of y'all know they probably needed marriage counseling by the time they got to their destination? Because they get to the destination and there is no room to stay. There's no place to stay. Now, Bethlehem, we know at that time, especially was a small little town. And if, if you understand that time frame, back in that time frame, the small town, there was no hotels. There was no place to stay. In fact, during that time, culture was that when you built your house, you usually built an upper room to your house and that upper room was made really that you could use for relatives or guests that would come stay overnight. Come to, that was the early version of the Airbnb stuff, you know, to come stay in her house. But Mary, Joseph and Mary, again, she's very pregnant. They get to Bethlehem and there is no room, no place to stay. And of course, you know, we talk a lot about the innkeeper said no room, but you know, there's no such reference to an innkeeper in the original scriptures to the story. It basically said that's the only reference that we read just a moment ago. There was no room for them in the end. In other words, they probably maybe went from house to house to house. Can we stay with you? Can we stay with you? Everybody like, no, sorry, we're full. No, no room. So now we think about what did they do? Well, a lot of people, you know, traditionally we see this kind of barn looking experience, you know, where they're in the major. But literally what took place and the early scholars really followed this that they weren't, he wasn't, Jesus, you know, wasn't born in a barn. Mary and Joseph didn't go find a barn. They literally, the only place that they could find was in the outskirts of Bethlehem was a cave. It was during that time frame, and especially in that region, that shepherds many times would use caves for shelter. So you know what? That almost even makes that hotel experience even worse, right? Come on. It wasn't in a manger, it wasn't in a hotel. It was literally probably in a cave. I love this artist's rendition of that very first Christmas night. If you guys will throw that up there on the screen for me here. That could have been possibly what it could have looked like there as Mary gives birth to Jesus Christ. Wow. Come on. How many of you ladies are like, woo, sign me up for that. <laughs> Absolutely not. You talk about a bad hotel experience. They had it. Come on, how many of y'all have ever had a bad hotel experience before? Anybody ever have a bad hotel experience before? I know uh, Tammy and I, we've had a few of those for us. Like you, you walk in, you check in, you walk in the room and like Tammy's like, uh-uh, I ain't staying here and we're back out again. I know where's the five stars? You know what? I'm, come on, any of you ladies know what I'm talking about? You know, but one of the funniest experiences that I've ever heard though, because I know Treva and Nathan Morrison was even telling us here several years ago, they took a youth group to Dallas and uh, on a youth trip and they stayed in this hotel that was right next to this train station there. So all night is clickety click, but they said they turned the lights off and they looked up and written on the ceiling in glow in the dark paint was sent as this simple statement, get out. <laughs> I mean, I know that's a bad hotel experience, right? I mean, get out. I'd have been like, I'm out of here, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but my funniest, the craziest, I think is many of y'all know Pastor Mike and Tamara Sturgeon are World Harvest Stillwater pastors. You guys know them, right? 
It's hilarious. It's just, you, you, you're going to laugh about this. But so we were talking about bad hotel experiences one time when Mike was still over here in Enid with us working as our associate here. And I uh, was talking about it. And he said, well, let me tell you. He said, whenever he and Tamara got married, they went on their honeymoon. Come on. How many of y'all excited for honeymoons, guys? Let me hear. Woo, honeymoon time. Woo, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm the only one who enjoyed my honeymoon. No, anyway. So they get to the hotel room. They check in, they go to the room, they're laying in bed and they got to looking at the walls and the walls of the hotel room did not go all the way to the ceiling. The ceiling was vaulted, it was only eight foot tall walls, so it was one of those rooms that, there was a bunch of rooms, but none of the rooms had walls that went clear to the top. Mike said it's kind of one of those things he expected the neighbors to stick their head over the wall and say, y'all are right in there, y'all need anything? Going to get ice, y'all need some too. On their honeymoon. I mean, you know, that's a bad hotel experience, right? And what's funnier, I said, wow, how long did you stay there? Check out and go to that. They said, we didn't. We stayed there the whole time. And I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> Come on. How many other people in this world, they can sleep anywhere and anything, right? Yeah. Don't sign me up on that one. Speaking of people who can sleep anywhere, you know, are you one of those people who can sleep anywhere? I just, this just came to me while I was preparing my message. My son-in-law, Lenny Giuliano, he's one of these guys, he can literally sleep anywhere. He used to, now he's getting older, so his body's not as young, but I, I, we got this picture here from several years ago. I just, this is Lenny sleeping. He's reading a book. He falls asleep in the middle of this threshold. Going into, the, the kid can sleep anywhere. I mean, he's like, you know, he, when it's time for him to go out, he is out of it, you know, but. So we go back to the story here. I know, I just had to throw it out. I had to embarrass Lenny, so he's already threatened to sue me over that picture. But anyway, I was like, <laughs> possessions, nine-tenths of law, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Mary and Joseph, the experience that they had, this was not favorable. You know, this is interesting. The seemingly insignificant event that took place so many years ago, that event, though, was the answer to the human problem of sin. It was at this event, this event that was significant so significant for every human being that had ever lived and for every person that would ever live after that. That's us right there, amen? An event that would divide time even between B.C. and A.D. It, it was a colossal event, but yet seemed so insignificant that besides Joseph and Mary and the shepherds that showed up that night, they were the only people that knew the significance of what took place that night. In the crazy busyness of all that took place there in Bethlehem as that town was flooded with guests, in, in the hustle and bustle that took place, Jesus came, our Savior. And the people at that time had no idea what it took place. Could it be that in the hustle and the bustle of our life today, that we could be missing out on something very significant that God has planned for us now? You know, if, if we could turn time back, if we could go back, if, if those people that Mary and Joseph went to and asked them, can we stay with you? Do you have space? Do you have a room? If those people, we could turn that back and they knew what was getting ready to happen, how many of y'all know they would have made room, right? They would have made some room. They probably, you know, maybe they wouldn't have had room, but they probably said, oh, Joseph, Mary, oh, Jesus is coming. They probably went upstairs like, hey, you, buddy, I told you you could stay here, but guess what? Right, so we got somebody else coming. Get your butt out of here. Come on, get your clothes out of here. Come on, get your toothbrush out of here. Come on, Mary, Mary Joseph, come on. We will make room. We will make room, right? You know, it's like many of y'all for the holidays, you know, Thanksgiving came, Christmas is coming. Come on, we're making room. Anybody got any relatives coming in from out of town? We've got relatives coming. We're trying to make some room right now. In fact, just kind of, I, I did not intend on going here, but Tame and I just through a chain of events, we have, we have now had an Airbnb, our own Airbnb called the Lincoln House. Thank you very much for those of you excited for us, but you know, so... <laughs> We've been fortunate to have it booked up, but we got a couple coming over Christmas. They're leaving on the 26th. Well, we got news yesterday. My oldest son, Brandon, he's coming home for Christmas for a few days. Like, woohoo! But Tammy says, we're going to put him up in our Airbnb. So my dad's side said, man, I'm glad he's coming. The business side of me says, wait a minute. I can't make any money off my son. You know what I mean? I mean, like... She said, we're going to go on. We're going to block out that week so our son can stay at our Airbnb. And I'm like, on the outside, I'm going, woo. But then I'm like, shoot, man, opportunity missed right there. But finally, I got the business side quieted down. I'm like, yes, let's open up. Let's make room. 
Make room. You know, so many times we go to effort. We make space for people we love in our lives. We got to make room. Come on, look at somebody beside you and tell them, you got to make room. So let's look at just a couple quick thoughts that I just want to drop into your heart. You pray over this and just see what God speaks to you about this. But really here those last few weeks, we've been talking about the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. And we've, we've been talking about this concept to not just be a person that knows Jesus as an acquaintance, but one who is abiding with Jesus. Come on, where's all my abiders at today? Come on, if you was here last week, come on, where's my abiders today, man? Here's a simple thought. One first simple thought I want to drop into your heart is this. Making room means that we have to manage the busyness of our life. Come on, how many of y'all feel like you're busy right now? Oh, we probably all are. Busy, busy, busy. Come on, we're busy. That's the most common word I hear anymore today. Oh, how you doing? Oh, I'm just busy. I'm busy. I got to do this. I got to go here. I got to do that. I'm busy, 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 busy. Anybody else besides me been busy? I mean, here we are, the second to the last Sunday of 2022. I still feel like just a few weeks ago, it was springtime when we was doing Easter thing. You know what? I can't believe we're here at the end of another year. I'm kind of struggling with this thing, wrapping my head around 2022 is over. Anybody else with me here at World Harvest Church today? I mean, we're just, you know, two weeks from today, January 1. I'm like, where is time going? Our world is spinning so fast right now. I still have this distinct memory. One of my earliest memories as a child was my first day of first grade. Anybody can go back that far? I know some of y'all got to go back really, 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 really far, but you know, my first day of first grade. Now we lived on a ranch 20 miles south of Perryton, Texas when I was started first grade. And so we didn't, you know, because of the distance, I didn't go to kindergarten. My first day of school was first grade. And I still remember very distinctly coming into that classroom First day, first grade, with this overwhelming, dreadful thought going through my mind like, oh my gosh, I got to do this for 12 years? <laughs> and having this over sense whelming like this is a lifetime that I am going to be in. And here I am 55 years later, graduated class of 1986, a proud Guyman Tiger. Come on, any class of 86 people? Yeah, just one over here, yeah. <laughs> here I am 55 years old, I'm, and, and I raised four kids, they're all out on their own, got two incredible grandkids, and I'm sitting here now, I'm like, whoa, so let's slow this thing called life down. Where's the brakes to this thing? This thing is going way too fast. Anybody know what I'm talking about here today? I want you to see something that Jesus says in Luke chapter 21. If you'd look over there with me right quick, see a question that I wrote down in my notes. Have we become so busy in our society that we have fallen guilty of not making room in our lives for Jesus? Sorry, I just don't got time. Look at Luke chapter 21 with me here. Because this is something Jesus speaks. Now, Luke chapter 21, this is a powerful chapter. In fact, I, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to dive into some of this here in 2023 because I believe the Lord is giving us a word for 2023 that it is time to prepare ourselves for what is to come. All right? So in Luke chapter 21 that Jesus gives a, just an incredible oratory of what the end times will look like. Now, I don't have no, I am not an end times preacher, all right? All I know is it's gonna happen the way that God wants it to happen and I'm gonna be ready to go, right? I, 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 I don't think the Lord's gonna come back today, all right? Uh, if he does, when I, we're going up in heaven, I'll say, well, I guess I was wrong, wouldn't I? You know, we're gonna go on, right? But Jesus gives us just some incredible just glimpses of what the end times look like. But I just want to just to nail down to verses 34 and verse 35 of Luke chapter 21. So if you would look with me, Jesus says here, he says, but take heed to yourselves. If we was to modernize this, he would say, take a look at your life. Examine yourself. Take heed to yourself. He said, lest your hearts be weighed down. With what? With carousing, with drunkenness. And look at this. And King James says, cares of this life. Cares of this life. And he said, in that day come to you 
unexpectedly. Verse 35, he said, for it will come as a snare. As a snare. What is a snare? A snare is a trap. Now, I'm a good old Oklahoma redneck boy. I grew up hunting and trapping coyotes. I know how it is to trap, and I'm a pretty good trapper at my time. And this is the picture that we see Jesus saying that the last of days, the end times are going to be like. For it will come as a snare on how many? Come on, everybody say all. A snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. He says the cares of this life. If you are living your life right now, and it seems like life is spinning so fast. In fact, I've had to stop saying that. People ask me, man, how's it going? I'm using my first response. I tell them my world is spinning really fast right now. And it's just another way to say, I'm just dang busy. Got a lot of stuff I'm dealing with. But Jesus says on the last days, you're going to have to be careful because the cares of life are going to come upon how many? Everybody, Right? So the answer is not having a life without a lot of cares. Our, our, our answer is to live a life full of cares, but be carefree. I don't know if I said that right. Right? We can still have a busy life, but still live carefree if we're managing it properly. All right? Listen to what the Passion Translation says. The Passion says this. It's the same passage. Be careful that you never allow your hearts to grow cold. Wow, do we see that in our culture right now? Yeah. Remain passionate and free from anxiety, the worries of this life. Then you will not be caught off guard by what happens. Look at this. Don't let me come and find you drunk or careless and living like everybody else. Verse 35. For that day will come as a shocking surprise to all. Like a downpour that drenches everyone, catching many unaware and unprepared. Church, there's a tremendous battle going on today that many are unaware of, and it is the battle for our time and our attention. Our time and our attention. I I, I heard about this, I make this, just thought about uh, a cartoon that came out many years ago. If you know who Martin Luther was, not Martin Luther King, the modern day Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, the man that reformed the church, and he wrote 90, the 95 Thesis, he pinned it to the walls and there was this cartoon uh, of Martin Luther sitting in a easy chair in front of a TV and the bubble says this over his head, should I write those 95 Theses today? Nah, let's see what's on TV instead. And the caption below it said, what would have happened if Luther had had television? See, all too often we allow the distractions of life to steal from us spiritual opportunities, whether for our own growth or for the advancement of the gospel. We live in such a busy society and we're so distracted. And I believe that it is stealing our joy, it's stealing our peace, and more importantly, it's stealing our time with Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell him you gotta make room. Come on, tell him you gotta make room. See, making room for Jesus requires effort on our part. See, making room for Jesus means that, that we are doing more than just giving Jesus some occasional attention every once in a while. It's making room for him every day in our life, giving him our attention seven days a week. Is that possible in our world? Yes, yes. Jesus doesn't want just a few moments here and there, hit or miss. He wants our heart. He wants our heart. You know, I, I think, you know, my own marriage with Tammy here just, uh, you know, we're celebrating 35 years of marriage. Come on. Hey, I'm going to celebrate that every year we get behind us. I'm celebrating that, amen, because that's unheard of in our culture today. Amen. We're going to keep raising the bar for y'all so y'all get busy. Okay? All right? But I think of our marriage, being married for 35 years, there is not one day, for the most part, that we have not gone without communicating somehow. There was a time when I went on a mission trip to Nicaragua, and I went three days without talking to my wife. I thought I was going to die. I mean, it was so bad, I finally told the missionary, I've got to find a phone. He said, do you know how dangerous it is out there? We're in this compound, 12-foot walls with razor wire on the top. I said, I got to talk to my wife. I got to talk to my wife. It had been three days. And I, I, they drove me out there, had security guards everywhere just to talk to Tammy. I mean, I know I got it bad. That's a good thing, right? 
But just think about this for a moment. There's not a day that goes by without her and I talking, somebody using phone calls, using text messages, something. We are constantly, seems like we're constantly communicating. Now, I would dare to say this, that if I was in the same house, the same community, the same place of work, if I went three or four days on a regular basis without giving my wife the time of day without talking to her, I don't know if I'd even be married today still. Come on, anybody else know what I'm talking about? Right? My relationship with my wife is so far beyond just a formality. It's something that I enjoy communicating with her on a regular basis. So here's a thought for you, for all of you that are married. If you communicated with your spouse as often as you do with Jesus, would you still be married? I hope so. Because I hope that you've made room for Jesus and Jesus is important to your life. Amen. Amen. Look at something Jesus said In Matthew chapter seven, and I want to be honest with you, church, this, this is a hard passage. This is one of these passages of scripture, to be honest with you, I do not have this theologically uh, wrap my head around this passage of scripture. I don't, I'm not sure about this scripture. I'm not sure how this fleshes out, but let me just give you the words of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter seven, verse 21 says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? Verse 23, look at this, what Jesus said. And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. Jesus tells us very specifically in this passage that there will be people that have a form of godliness in their life, but they have no relationship. Wow. Is Jesus just an acquaintance in your life or is he your friend? Had a conversation with a very well-known businessman here in Enid that's been in Enid almost all of his life, very successful businessman. He's in the stage of his life now that he doesn't know how much many more years of life that he has living to live. And he is on a mission right now to share Jesus with everybody that he can. And we had this conversation. He says, you know what? I know a lot of people in this community that are claimed to be a Christian. So they're people, they give God a moment of their time on a Sunday morning, but they go to work and they live and they do everything they do without really having a relationship with Jesus. And it's like one of those things like, oh my goodness, it's just one of those things that you become so familiar with an area, you know, that you don't realize. There's a lot of people here today that have the acquaintance of Jesus, know who he is. Almost every red-blooded American today knows about the Christmas story, knows about the manger, has seen that before. But how many people really have a loving relationship with Jesus? There's a difference in there. There's a difference. John Renault and I was having a discussion. Those you know, John, you know, we talking this week kind of about this concept of being an abider and how it's about Jesus wants more than just an acquaintance, a casual relationship. He wants an intimate relationship with us. And he said, you know, an example of this, he said, he said, Brad, I've known you since 2016. And now I've only really known him, had conversations with him in the last year and a half as he and his wife, Rebecca, and his family started coming to World Harvest Church. I mean, he's a cool guy, man. He's like, cool. And he said, but I've known you for a long time. And I like that helped me wrap my mind around this. How can somebody know Jesus, but not have a relationship? I think our churches today are full of people like that. I'm gonna come in and do my thing. I'm gonna come in, come on, Pastor. Hour 20 minutes. Wow, you've got nine minutes left, Pastor. You better hurry up. <laughs> come on, the keyboarder just stepped out there. Sydney's come on, she's your time clock. When Sydney steps out on the stage, starts playing those keys, you got it just a few minutes. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Thank you, Sydney, for coming out. <laughs> How are we treating Jesus? Are we making room? Come on, turn your neighbor and see, you gotta make room. Come on, we gotta make room. God is calling us, church, I believe this, to a deeper relationship. Deeper relationship. Let me close with my second and final point is this. Making room means walking with Jesus every day. That's what it means to make room. If you have not seen the Chosen series, I would encourage you to get online, watch the Chosen series. 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is a series, it's a fictional depiction of the life of Jesus while he walked the earth. And I say fictional because I'd say probably 50 to 75% of it is fictional, but the other 25 or more percent, it is word and it is powerful. I love the story. In fact, season three, I think, uh, Tony, weren't you in season three somewhere? I think he was in season three of the crowd shot, the multitude. Look out there for Tony Whedon. He's in that shot somewhere. But anyway, um, the one thing that has just so much blessed me about this because as Dallas Jenkins has written the story of Jesus, kind of it's the backstories to the disciples, the backstories, stuff that we don't see in the scriptures. I'm watching this, oh my goodness, I could see that happening. I could imagine that. You know, he's not really teaching doctrine. He's just really wanting people to be exposed to the humanity of Jesus and just really what took place. It is amazing. Watch it. There's two, episodes, two seasons out. Season three started one and two is out now, I believe. You can watch those. But you know what is very interesting? Caught me as I was watching that. As I watched this life of Jesus, what it could have been like. There was not one moment, even I've gone back to the scriptures, and there's not one moment that Jesus stopped with somebody and said, hey, you want this life? Let me pray with you the sinner's prayer. I never see one moment where Jesus says, hey, would you bow your head with me? Repeat this after me. Every instance that somebody encounters Jesus and they're like, wow, I want that. He simply responds to them with two words. He looks at them and simply says this, follow me. That's it. Follow me. I believe that what Jesus is saying to every one of us here today is simply two words, follow me. And to follow him, you're going to have to make some room. We may have to get some stuff out to make room. Come on, when he says, follow you, you got, okay, let me look at my calendar. You know, hey, I got space for you. Like I do some of y'all when you say, let's go to lunch. I'll look at my calendar and say, hey, hey, let's, let's Thursday at noon. Let's go Thursday at noon. Okay, write it down, write it down. Do we do Jesus that way? Jesus, I'm just too busy right now. I want you to stand to your feet with me here this morning. Jesus doesn't want just your church attendance. Come on, Jesus didn't want, doesn't want your money. Come on. You know what he wants? He wants our heart. He wants to walk with us. He wants us to follow him. To walk with him. I really don't know what these next few years is gonna hold. I really, there's a lot of people that have been speaking prophetically that 2023, 2024 are gonna be just as difficult as the last two years. And I'm not prophesying that. I'm just saying what some things are being said. So I really believe that there is a cry, especially to us as Americans, that Jesus is saying, come on, just follow me. Follow me. Walk with me. Make room for him. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like? This is a couple things. Let me just throw out to you real quickly. I think for me, I I like taking a few moments before I even leave the house every morning, spending some time with Jesus. I I love my soaking music. This, what Sydney's playing right now, just that key in. I love that, you know, just some soft music, some soft music. That's to me, that's spiritual. I love those moments. You know, whatever it looks like in your life, have some time every day, not just on Sunday, just every day, spend a few moments. When you get in your car, instead of kicking on the radio, maybe just spend a few moments, wherever you're going, just let's have a conversation with Jesus for that few moments. I'm not saying you gotta do it every time, but just have a few conversations. Hey, here's something, a fresh idea for a lot of our younger generation. Take a moment before you eat your meal and pray. Give God some thanks. That is being lost in our culture today, to stop and pray. I love it. Both my grandkids, man, they, they get to this moment. They, you know, when they're with us, we're like, let's pray for our food. And I asked the other day, who wants to pray? Caden goes, man, I'll, I'll pray. I said, Caden, take it. And I did, the dude went into like a two to three minute prayer. He had his head down, his hands over. I couldn't hear what he's saying, but I'm like, he said, amen. I'm like, woo, Caden, woo, high five. And we was driving around later on, just he and I. I said, did you like my prayer? And so I was like, I didn't know what you said, but I was like, man, I love that prayer, man. You keep giving it, dude. 
Parents, we need to be teaching, making room for Jesus with our kids. Come on, here's a, if you got kids still at home, spend some moments praying with them or Bible stories, reading stories before they go to bed. Man, my time spun out so fast with my kids, I, I don't have that anymore. I got my grandkids now. Spend a few moments before they go to school. Pray with them before they go to school. What are we doing? We're taking practical moments to make room for Jesus. I'm not saying we got to make room for Jesus and just be weird all the time. Like, woo, you know, and just come on, spend some time with Jesus. Let him be with you wherever you go and whatever you do. Let him be in your talk. Let him be in your work, right? Let him be in the truck with you, wherever you're at. Jesus wants to be with you. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come to the close of this service this morning. Lord, I, I really believe that you're speaking something to every heart and to every life. to make space, to make room for you. Not just blowing through a devotion on a morning or saying a prayer, but moments, just those moments. Those moments. Just to give you that nod, just to let you know that, hey, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to take 30 seconds right quick and just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me through this message today? What is it the Lord wants to, for you to take out of this sanctuary today? Come on, just take 30 seconds and ask him, what are you speaking to me? Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, man, do it. Do it. Do it. You know, going back to the Christmas story, I'm just, part of the Christmas story we haven't talked about is the wise men that showed up. There's so much more. I'll probably, I can do this another time, but just give me, let me give you just a quick synopsis of this. The wise men, some scholars tell us, was probably highly educated men from Persia. The wise men did not show up that first night there in the cave. So your nativity scenes, it's got the shepherds, the wise men, that's false. That did not happen. The wise men did not show up probably until nine to 18, could have been as old as 18 months that Jesus was when the wise men finally made it. But it's amazing about the stories, they traveled a thousand, probably a thousand miles to get there. There was educated men from Persia that may not even been on camels. It could have been horses, I don't know. It wasn't three of them, it was a whole group. You didn't travel just with three people, you traveled in big groups at the time. But it's amazing how they went on a journey, probably could have taken them anywhere from nine months to 18 months to get there, just to lay their eyes on baby Jesus. The child at the time, it wasn't a baby at the time they came. I've been reading this book called The Heavenly Man uh, but Brother Yun, he's very instrumental in the success of the Chinese underground church back in the 80s and the 90s. And I have been just so torn as I've read his story, how tortured, how persecuted these people have been in China just to do what we do so freely here, like right now. And it's just really opened my eyes to... We as Americans, we can have such a formality that we're not really knowing Jesus versus people like those wise men or even the Chinese people. Man, they're passionate about any moment they have. One phrase of scripture, they're passionate about. Well, we got Bibles all over our houses and homes. What am I saying? Church, let's don't be spoiled Americans. Let's be people that love Jesus and making room and are pursuing him, whatever that looks like. Let's pursue Jesus and make room for him. Amen. Prayer team, you come to the front at this.